Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is on stewardship, motives of the heart. We're getting near the end of that series. This is lesson number 11 in that series entitled Debt, A Daily Decision. Hmm, wonder what that will be about. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Please bow with us. Our kind and loving Father, as we consider these materials that have been prepared for us, may we be challenged. May we be educated about the challenges of uh, debt and all that it implies for our lives. May those of us who have opportunity now to consider these things Think about our role in your kingdom as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our world has reached the place where it almost runs on debt. It seems like nothing gets done, even at government levels, without more debt. Uh, and most of us owe something. Maybe it's for a house, maybe it's for a car, maybe it's credit cards. Um, how much do we owe Jesus? Well, our lives. <laughs> yeah. Will we ever be able to repay what Jesus has done for us? Obviously not. Well, financial debt is always a problem. It may be necessary to purchase a house or buy a car or, or build a church. How about that? Or get an education. But it must also always be done with careful consideration as to how we will manage to pay the money back. It's very interesting to notice that Ellen White envisioned saw Satan talking to his angels, and what he said is concluded in the following paragraph. This is a fairly lengthy paragraph. Carrie, I think you want to read that for us. Keep in mind, this is Satan talking to his angels. Ellen White is visiting it only in vision. I saw that Satan bade his angels lay their snares, especially for those who were looking for Christ's second appearing and keeping all the commandments of God. Satan told his angels that the churches were asleep. He would increase his power and lying wonders, and he could hold them. But, he said, the sect of Sabbath keepers we hate. They are continually working against us and taking from us our subjects to keep the hated law of God. Go, make the possessors of lands and money drunk with cares. If you can make them place their affections upon these things, we shall have them yet. They may profess what they please, only make them care more for money than for the success of Christ's kingdom or the spread of the truths we hate. Present the world before them in the most attractive light that they may love and idolize it. We must keep in our ranks all the means of which we can gain control. The more means the followers of Christ devote to his service, the more they will injure our kingdom by getting our subjects. As they appoint meetings in different places, we are in danger. Be very vigilant then. Cause disturbance and confusion if possible. Destroy love for one another. Discourage and dishearten their ministers, for we hate them. Present every plausible excuse to those who have means, lest they hand it out. Control the money matters if you can, and drive their ministers to want and distress. This will weaken their courage and zeal. Battle every inch of ground. Make covetousness and love of earthly treasures the ruling traits of their character. As long as these traits rule, salvation and grace stand back. Crowd every attraction around them, and they will surely be ours. And not only are we sure of them, but their hateful influence will not be exercised to lead others to heaven. When any shall attempt to give, put within them a grudging disposition that it may be sparingly. Wow. That comes from early writings, page 266 and I think 267. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine that Satan is holding conferences like that every day as we, as we live our lives and what he's saying about us? So, why is it so attractive for, to people to, to borrow money? They want to spend it, right? Everybody wants to spend their money. 
So they want to spend beyond what they have, what they have and so they borrow. Um, there are not many stories in the Bible about borrowing. There's one famous one found in 2 Kings 6, uh, 1 through 7. Uh, you remember the story about the borrowed axe? We're not going to take time to read the, the whole thing, but you remember the axe flew off the handle. They were, what were they doing? What were they trying to accomplish? Enlarging one of the schools of the prophets. Exactly. They were building a new school or an extra room for the schools of the prophets. So surely that would be a, 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 a worth, worthwhile thing to do. And yet uh, the axe head flew off and I wonder, you know, wonder how much Satan was directly involved, might have been directly with involved in that, <laughs> fell into the Jordan River, and then what happened? The young man said, oh dear, it's borrowed. And so Elisha prayed, and what, what was the result? It floated. The axe head floated, and they reached out there and grabbed <laughs> it from the water and had it back again. Well, why do we borrow money? Because we need it now. <laughs> we need it now. We, we okay. Think, we think we do. <laughs> is it a need or is it a want? Or yeah, desire? well, that's one of the big questions. That's what we tell ourselves. When we do that, we are risking the possibility of not being able to pay back in the future. And Ecclesiastes 8, verse 7 has something to say about that. None of us knows what is going to happen, and there is no one to tell us. I mean, surely we don't know what the future is, and even the angels of heaven don't know the future, but God knows. So there are pretty straight and scary comments about borrowing in the Bible. Psalm 37, 21. Fred, do you have that? Yes, uh, the wicked borrow and never pay back, but good people are generous with their gifts. That's a pretty clear distinction between the good ones and the bad ones, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 5, 5, let's look at that really quick. Better not to promise at all than to make a promise and not keep it. So Solomon warned about making promises that you cannot keep. In Deuteronomy 28, 44, and 45, near the end of Moses' speech to the children of Israel on the border of the promised land, he mentioned the fact that disasters will come upon you if you're not faithful to God. In fact, you remember that whole section of if, you do, if you're good, God will bless you. If you're bad, all sorts of terrible things will happen to you. That's the oldest philosophy that we have record on. That's mm -hmm. uh, the book of Job. Uh, look at yourself. You're, mm -hmm. <laughs> God's not smiling on you. You can look at your condition, Job. Mm -hmm. You might even be destroyed, it says, and you will not be able to have money to lend to others, but they will lend to you, and they will be your rulers. All of these passages make it very clear that we must be very careful about borrowing money and only do so following wise counsel and while serving God. Now, many of you know that uh, the church has some very strict policies about even building churches being very strict about what percentage of the money you have to have in hand before you can build. And a lot of people think, well, this is, this is, you know, why? And you hear people groaning and moaning. You know, why do we have to have all that before we can even start building? I mean, if we just get started, people would get inspired, and then they would give more money, and everything would be fine. So why does the church have this very strict policy? Probably learned the lesson the hard way. Yeah, probably lots of times. When uh, there's a temptation to borrow, a terrible temptation to borrow for in, on many sides, borrowing is the center of our consumer culture. It affects the rich and the poor. What's the latest calculation in the United States? Every single citizen, if you count, the, if you spread out the government debt, every single citizen owes two hundred thousand dollars or some ridiculous thing like that. So we are advised it's best not to start borrowing if you can possibly avoid it. If you're already a debtor, pay, to, pay it back as soon as possible. If we believe that all we have is given to us through God's blessings. We must not allow worldly money to rule over us. How can we be certain that we are not digging a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves? Wow. People who allow themselves to become entangled in too much debt have a hard time focusing what, on what is really important in life. Often all they can think about is to worry about their debt. So what is the attraction about borrowing and spending? Well, someone's 
Dennis, I think you already mentioned it. The story is quoted from Genesis 25, 27 to 34. Let me just read that for you. The boys grew up, talking about Esau and Jacob. The boys grew up and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man who loved the outdoor life, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac preferred Esau but he, because he enjoyed eating the animals Esau killed, but Rebekah preferred Jacob. One day while Jacob was cooking some bean soup, Esau came in from hunting. He was hungry and said to Jacob, I'm starving, give me some of that red stuff. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob answered, I will give it to you if you give me your rights as the firstborn son. Esau said, all right, I'm about to die. What good will my rights do me then? Jacob answered, first, make a vow that you will give me your rights. Esau made the vow and gave him his rights to Jacob. Then Jacob gave him some bread and some of the soup. He ate and drank, then got up, got up and left. That was all Esau cared about his rights as the firstborn son. And we read over in Hebrews 12, verse 17, that he tried to get it back. And what happened? He sought after it with tears, but he never got it back. Jacob was no way going to give it back. In Esau's case, it was hunger that led him to make a mistake. Contrast the example of Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? He fasted for 40 days. And then Satan came and tempted. And he thought, man, if Esau can't go without one meal, surely if Jesus after 40 days should be susceptible to temptation, right? But Jesus refused to, refused to yield in any way. So I can assure you, you out there and us here, none is, God is not expecting any of us to fast for 40 days. But Jesus' example, what should we learn from it? We shouldn't be hungry? It's possible mm -hmm. to resist. Yeah, it's possible to resist temptation. Um, we need to conquer the desire for instant gratification. I, I, don't, I want it now. Okay. But he yeah. says... When? We have an example of that, when Eve wanted it now. Yeah. She didn't even wait to talk to Adam about it. Wouldn't that have been something? I don't know if this is the correct translation, but we're talking about the word fast. We always think that it has to do with going hungry. Mm -hmm. But in Isaiah 58, 6... Is not this the fast that I choose? Yeah. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. Mm -hmm. Share your bread in the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see a naked to cover him and so forth. It's a different take on yeah. being yeah. a fast. Of course, uh, there's, uh, it was the Muslims. They go hungry all day and then they uh, pick out on... Uh, well, you, you eat before sunrise and after sunset. Yeah. At, at Ramadan, and during Ramadan. Yeah. Well, Jesus challenges us to share being joint heirs with him. Look at a couple of verses. Romans eight seventeen. Since we are his children, we, we, we will possess the blessings he keeps for his people. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share God's, we share Christ's sufferings, hold on here, we share Christ's sufferings, we will also share his glory. And Titus 3, 7 says it more or less the same thing. We must not give in when tempted, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No prize that can be purchased with worldly money could ever gain eternal life for us. That's pretty clear, right? Well, can you think of another story about somebody who couldn't control his... Instant, he needed instant satisfaction, instant. Uh, the example of David is given. David, yeah. Second Samuel 2.11. So he goes out after having a comfortable meal and his army's off fighting on his behalf, conquering the enemy and so forth. And he goes up on the roof of his house and he looks over and there's a beautiful woman bathing. And you wonder exactly why she's out there bathing in the middle of the day. Maybe she wasn't aware that Let's hope she wasn't aware that it was possible for someone to see her. And of course, David asks who it is, and then he asks her to come over and see him. And before you know, before you know it, she finds out that she is pregnant by David. And there's a lot of questions about that story. Um, I I wonder, you know, she'd been married to. 
uh, Uriah. Uriah for quite a long time. If she'd had children, she wouldn't be out there bathing in the nude. So did God prevent her from having children just so that David could be tempted? One contact with David and she's pregnant. Or was there something wrong with Uriah? Could very well be. You got a man of war. <laughs> yeah. Takes two to tangle. Yeah, that's <laughs> also true. You know, you know, all those, or many of those stories, including that one, it does, apparently doesn't bother God all that much. What bothers him the most is, is violence, mm -hmm. which violates the freedom on, or rape in that particular game, which would be a type of violence. Yeah. But for people, two people to get together, the whole history of the world is that. Mm -hmm. But that the violence, I think, is the biggest thing, that, that uh, which violates the freedom of the other person. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, as we know, this little foray and the de death of Uriah led to four of David's leading children being killed, either murdered or died in war or whatever. Well, he's got his friend, his trusted general. He sends him out to the front lines yeah. and asks as the rest of them to withdraw. Man, you got a friend like that. You're not indeed of too many enemies. Okay, so let's think of another example. Think of the story of Eve. She had a garden full of the most luscious fruit that you could possibly imagine on all kinds of trees, and she was standing within easy visual distance of the tree of life and she has to try the, the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She probably had too much time on her hands. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, you know, what else she could do? Uh, Adam's out there nail, naming the animals and whatever. And she <laughs> well, let's just read the story. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord had made. This is Genesis 3. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? Now, I'm sure, I could be wrong, but I'm quite sure that we do not have the full conversation. We only have some key parts of that conversation. <clears throat> um, and she says, and the implication in the Hebrew here is that God doesn't want you to eat from any tree in the garden, not just this tree, any tree in the garden. <coughs> Excuse me. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Now, we have no record in the scripture that we have preserved about touching it. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. Almost, almost the first words out of his mouth is, God is a liar. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become, like, become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband and he also ate it. And that was the beginning of woe. Well, can you imagine yourself, and I've asked other groups to say this, but I, I want you to think about this out there, and I'm asking the group here to think about this. If you had been an angel in heaven, looking down, and watching Eve get closer and closer to that tree, and then hearing the conversation, what would you have thought? It depends which side <laughs> okay. of the angels you are on, but Eve manifestly departed from the, the very essence of what she was made, which is love. If God is love and we were made in the image of God, love was already in her heart, which mm -hmm. means that to do this or to even think about it had to be a departure from that mm -hmm. love. Yeah. So some of the angels up there were watching, probably hoping she wouldn't go there and that that love would stay where it should be in her heart, while others were probably routing the other way. Mm -hmm. Especially the ones on Satan's side, huh? Yep. <laughs> Romans 8, 8 says, those who obey their human nature cannot please God. Those who obey their human nature cannot please God. We have to be careful. I think yeah. with the word, with the translation human nature is 
it's your carnal nature. Yeah. And of course, we have desires of the flesh, but love should sometimes counteract those yes. very desires. Absolutely. Philippians 3.19 says, basically giving in to our bodily desires, of w the, the desires of the flesh will send us to hell. John said, shared similar sentiments in 1 John 2, 16 and 17. Let me just turn to that for a moment. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. So, if all this so-called so great stuff here on this world, what people want so earnestly they're willing to risk their lives for it, is all going to be gone. So why is this instant gratification such, a, such an attraction? Have you ever been to a car dealer or someplace like that and you start talking to them and they want you to do it right now. Well, we'll give you a big discount. Well, there's a sale going on right now. Do it right now. Do it right now. What, what's going on there? A lot of hot air. <laughs> well, they don't want it to be a long, drawn-out thing. They want you to buy, and then they'll move on to the next person. It's they, efficiency. There's this desire, because what are the chances are if you say, well, I'll come back tomorrow, there's a pretty good chance you won't come back tomorrow. Yeah. Right. So they want you to strike, you know, strike while the iron is hot kind of thing. Well, we also know that patience is a virtue that God really, really wants us to develop. It is certainly not natural for human beings. Um, our world does not regard patience as a popular idea. As we look around, what do we see? Instant food, fast food anyway, uh, quick get-rich-quick schemes, quick fixes to all kinds of things. But Christians, we need to have a longer view. We need to recognize, in light of everything we do, we need to keep in mind the eternity. From, it, from time immemorial in the past to time immemorial in the future, we need to recognize that this larger picture needs to be the backdrop for everything we think and do. But to many people, patience is like an unwanted diet. So who do you think is more concerned about their money? Is it the, the poor who are living from paycheck to paycheck, to paycheck or is it the wealthy who are worried that, they, that worried that they might lose some of it? Can be both. Yes, exactly. The thing about the life of Paul now, um, it's hard to know exactly where all he went. And there's a lot, big parts of his life which we don't know about. But it has been estimated that, estimated that he, in his missions, he walked at least 6,000 miles. Try, try to imagine that. Traveling and, and constantly in danger. You know, 2 Corinthians 11. Maybe I can read just a few verses of that. Um, uh, let's see here. Is Paul suffering? Okay, starting with verse 16. I repeat, no one should think that I'm a fool, but if you do, at least accept me as a fool. So then I will have a little to boast of. Of course, what I am saying now is not what the Lord would like me to say. In this matter of boasting, I'm really talking like a fool. But since there are so many who boast for merely human reasons, I will do the same. You yourselves are so wise and so, so you gladly tolerate fools. I mean, you, he's really laying on the scorn here. You tolerate anyone who orders you about or takes advantage of you or traps you or looks down on you or slaps you in the face. I am ashamed to admit that we were too timid to do those things. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I'm talking like a fool, I will be just as daring. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I am a better servant than they are. I worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more. I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes. Uh, 
by the Jews three times, I was whipped by the Romans. I mean, these are all things that happened before any of the things that we normally think about happening in the life of Paul. I mean, he'd been through all this stuff. He, the time when he was writing 2 Corinthians, this was very early in his ministry. Once I was stoned, I had been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. This isn't the shipwreck that we know about. This is but way before that. We don't know anything about it except these few words here. In my many travels, I've been in danger from floods, from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things, every day I'm under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. I mean, think of, of the burden that Paul carried and all the time going through all, all the things that he went through. But he was able to say on several occasions later, whatever I have, I'm satisfied. I'm not asking for more. Then he said, for, for me to live is for Christ. Um, it, would it be possible for someone to live that kind of a life in, in, in 2018? Why not? What would it look like? Walk across the country, back it, again? Uh, well, maybe not exactly as it would be lived back in those days. But nonetheless, somebody could be so dedicated to the message of Christ that their own life and what happens in prison, uh, on shipwrecks or whatever, no longer really matters. What matters is preaching that message of love that Christ has brought to the universe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Matthew said it very clearly, of course, quoting Jesus, Matthew 6, 33, <laughs> instead be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God, what, what, he, what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Is that still true? Mm -hmm. Would we depend on a promise like that? Perhaps, but even Jesus was not fed for the 40 days. Yeah. Well, do we think about when we, when we get our paycheck, do we think now this is money that I have earned or do we think this is money which God has given me to use for his cause? That doesn't mean we, we aren't responsible for feeding ourselves and how, clothing ourselves and having a home and so forth, but it's very easy to slip into that mode where we think this is mine, I can do whatever I want to do with it. Um, how much of our money do we spend for the glory of God? Well, the, our Bible study guide recommends that we, we set up a budget, a family budget. If you have a clear budget saying, okay, this month we have this amount of money, it's easier to stay within that budget instead of overspending. Well, look at Luke 14, 27 to 30. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't talking about people in our day walking around carrying wooden crosses. What is he talking about? Some kind of hardship. Okay. <clears throat> he goes on to say, if anyone of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and work out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation. All will see what hap all who see what happened will laugh at you. This man began to build but couldn't finish the job, they will say. So, what's he talking about here? Make plans. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't think about yourself. Yeah, even, even within the church, even in terms of planning church projects, make sure that you can do it and you have it well planned and you carry out the plan according to the way it was planned. Uh, don't just, okay, let's do it. Uh, whoever can do whatever, whatever. One of the challenges of, of working with church groups in our day is that there almost everybody is a volunteer. And some people, there's some people who are very poorly qualified and they volunteer for everything. 
and there's other people who are probably well qualified that hardly volunteer at all. And how do you deal with that? I'd like to say that stewardship is the management of the love we have in our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's easy to think that love is just a matter of giving and moving forward with projects and God will provide. Mm -hmm. That's presumption, not faith. A true management of the love in our hearts is thinking thoroughly about these things. You can do such thing as give too much to some people who end up becoming dependent on you. That's not doing them a favor. Yeah. And vice versa, we can not give enough. So we need to manage our love. Very good. Well, Deuteronomy 28 has a message for us. Um, Dennis, is that yours? Yes. <laughs> he will send rain in season from his rich storehouse in the sky and bless all your work so that you will lend to many nations, but you will not have to borrow from any. Good News Bible, Deuteronomy 28, 12. Okay, so sometimes people get too much rain, <clears throat> and sometimes they get not enough. And does that mean that God doesn't know how to parcel out the right amount to us? No. Well, the Bible goes on while you're thinking about that. <laughs> The Bible goes on and talks about the challenge of taking on other people's debts. Have you ever tried to take on somebody else's debts? Hmm. You actually many times do people a disservice because it's just like kind of like winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. It distorts a person's perception of how, how things work uh, about mm -hmm. reality. And uh, like they will say, easy come, easy go. You know, they, mm -hmm. <coughs> Gary, I think you're next there. No, oh. I, had, I had this. Oh, yeah, that's right. You yeah, did. I'm sorry. Just, he's, he's Go ahead. Next there. Uh, there must be a strict gar a, there must be a strict regard to economy, or a heavy debt will be incurred. Keep within bounds. Shun the incurring of debt as you would shun leprosy. Um, wow. Letter sixty eighteen ninety six. Council on stewardship. Ship two seventy two. It's interesting that Ellen White says that. She repeatedly went into personal debt to start institutions, to start colleges, to start hospitals, and so forth like that. But she knew where the money was going to come, where it was going to come from, and she always paid her debts um, up until there were some problems at the very end of her life, which unfortunately she didn't have any control of. But uh, I mean, look at how many institutions she started. And many of them she started by, she said, okay, I can, I can put up this much money and I know where I can get the next. And okay, I want you to start this building. I want you to do this. I'm gonna, and she, boy, she put, she put her money where her mouth was. She didn't beat around the bush. Um, but for others who maybe don't have such a regular steady income, that can be a personal pro become a problem that's almost like a master. Unfortunately, in our day, so many things run on debt that we have come to think of it as almost as a requirement for doing business. We read about cities that go bankrupt. Whole, city, whole nations exist on debt, and some are on the brink of bankruptcy. I just read this morning as I turned on my computer and hit the news that there's one of the nations, I won't mention it by name, that is the ent entire nation is on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, you know, how do you live in a place like that? Very carefully. Well, it's happened before in history. Yeah. yeah. So how different would the progress of the gospel be if every Seventh-day Adventist paid a faithful tithe and avoid getting into financial problems in this life? Any idea? Be nice to see it. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice to see it? <clears throat> Gary, I think you're next. Make a solid, solid covenant there. Yes. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessings you will pay your debts and then owe no man anything if you live on porridge and bread. It is so easy in preparing your table to throw out of your pocket 25 cents for extras. Take care of the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. 
it is the mite here and the mites there that are spent for, for this, that, and the other that soon run up into dollars. Deny self at least while you are walled in with debts. Do not falter, be dis do not falter, be discouraged, or turn back. Deny your taste, deny the indulgence of appetite, save your pence and pay your debts. Work them off as fast as possible. When you can stand forth a free man again, owing no man anything, you will have achieved a great victory. Wow. 1877, Councils on Stewardship, page 257. We might chuckle when Ellen White talks about pennies and 25 cents. I can tell you, at the time when this was written, 25 cents would buy two people a very good meal in a restaurant. Okay? However, we need to remember that in those days, as I said, we can buy a complete meal. So why do many Christians fall behind in their financial affairs and end up in debt? What are we saying to fellow church members and the world when we drive the latest cars, live in the very expensive houses, and otherwise live affluent lives that we can't really afford? Well, there's a famous verse in the Bible that many of us are familiar with, found in Proverbs 6 and goes on to verse 8. Lazy people should learn a lesson from the way ants live. They have no leader, chief, or ruler, but they store up their food during the summer, getting ready for winter. So, um, did they have a big council down below the ground there somewhere and say, well, okay, you can save this part, and you do this, and you do that, and that, and that, and we'll manage to save enough for the winter? What do they do? Depends a little bit on the ants, but yeah. they're, all, they're all industrious, generally speaking. <coughs> they, they just do it because they're programmed. There's no big council together, nothing like that. It's just the way they are. And those are habits that we probably should learn, but um, think of the wisest man who's ever lived, according to the Bible, telling us to look at an animal, uh, an insect that's programmed and follow its example. Does that seem a little crazy? Are we so bad at money management that we need to learn from, that, from ants? Clearly they prepare for winter and they do it well. So how well are we doing? Jim, you want to? Money needlessly spent is a double loss. Not only is it gone, but its potential for earning is also gone. Had we set it aside, it could have been multiplying on earth through savings or in heaven through giving. Saving is a discipline that de develops authority over money instead of letting money take us wherever it whims, or excuse me, wherever our whims incline, we take control. Okay. That's quoted from our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Um, it's quoted from Randy Alcorn in Money, Possessions, and Eternity. Well, is it really true that it's easier? Let me just read these two, three verses. They're Proverbs 13, verse 11 and verse 18. The more easily you get your wealth, the sooner you will lose it. The harder it is to earn, the more you will have. Is that really true? I thought it was easy come, easy go. <laughs> well, that's what he says. Well, I thought it was hard come, easy go. <laughs> <laughs> Some who, who will not learn will be poor and disgraced. Anyone who listens to, um, hold on here, let me finish it. Anyone who listens to correction is respected. There's a, was a, a phrase, never, never a borrower nor lender be. I think that's from Hamlet. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's been said that if you lend to s something to a friend, you end up losing the money and the friend. Yeah. Well, plan carefully and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. And what about that? I'm still wondering. I mean, look at the people who, well, you already mentioned the lottery winners. They get a huge windfall of money and usually it ruins their lives. Yeah. Um, 
So easy come, easy go. Is that correct? What, and if it's correct, why would it be correct? History <laughs> shows. You that haven't developed the skills necessary to hang on to it if you get it too quickly. You if you get it slowly, then you, you're developing skills. The mentality of a person that uh, buys lottery tickets and things of that nature, uh, they don't really, I don't know if they know what the numbers are, but it's a very pretty sure way of losing money. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, well, unless you're intentionally trying to support public schools or something. Yeah. You can, you yeah, well, can I, that, that's, a, that's kind of a con job, too, because what they did is they stopped using money, other monies uh, for what would normally be part of the budget. So it's, it's all deception. Yeah. Well, it's probably true that if you have to work really hard to get the money, you respect it more. So I probably... Yeah. If, if you have to work hard for your money, you have more respect for money, you have more respect for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is the fruit, it's the, the fruit, you might say, of one's labor, which is the money that we then have a choice to use to, to help others. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we receive it all in one shot, uh, we don't realize the value of that money and we end yeah. up wasting it distorts your perception of reality because it came easy that time uh, why sh what would keep your number from coming up another time mm -hmm. you know it's uh, you know if you, history is tends to repeat itself you think and yeah well what really matters is not how much money we have but rather how well we're using the money we have uh, when investing, we need to spread out our risks. That's a pretty, that's a policy that goes way back to the days of Solomon. It's also a good idea to find competent expert help to advise us. If we have money available to, 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 to invest, get some good advisors. Always remember that it is God who gives us the ability to gain wealth, Deuteronomy 8, 18. The safest investments are always those investments placed in the bank of heaven. And why does he say that? Why, why does the Bible say that? Matthew thirteen forty four. The kingdom of heaven is like this: a man happens to find a treasure hidden in the field. He covers it up again, and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has, and then goes back and buys that field. So, was that a good investment? Well, we don't know exactly what was there, but. Apparently he thought it was. There's nobody sorry for doing it. <laughs> Is that really the point of that statement in the Bible? Or? It seems like there's another lesson there than... than okay, what would it be? That, well, that um, you have faith in, in something that's valuable and you put everything into it mm -hmm. because of the faith. It's not necessarily focusing on the money. Okay. Well, in heaven, there are no recessions, no risks, no thieves, no market downturns, no moths, no purses that wear out. So we can always be safe investing in heaven, right? Well, look at Luke 12, 33. Uh, sell all your belongings. This is advice that Jesus gave to one of his followers. Sell all your belongings, give the money to the poor, provide for yourselves purses that don't wear out, and save your riches in heaven where they will never decrease because no thief can get to them and no moth can destroy them. For your heart will always be where your riches are. Should we, should all Adventists, all faithful members of God's family be out there begging on the street because they've given everything they have to feed the poor? Of course not. So how do we, and how do we understand that passage? First of all, I think the passage is translated in a way to give a false impression because it really gives your surplus to the mm -hmm. poor. And look at all the stuff people have in their storerooms in, uh, yeah. <laughs> that they haven't looked at or touched for years. It's just a waste. And uh, you remember the message of John the Baptist. If you have two coats, give one to the poor. He didn't say give them both to the poor. Yeah. So I think we have to be careful how this text is interpreted. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
Okay, 2 Corinthians 4.18 has some good advice for us. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. What's he talking about? What are the things that are seen? This earth. This everything that's on this earth, right? Uh, the thing. What's what is unseen? Heaven. The things that are heaven, God's kingdom, whatever's involved in that, the angels, everything up there. So, which one of those is going to last the longest? Heaven. The unseen, right? Well, let's be honest. God has given every one of us a set of talents and skills. The question is, how are we to use them? Now, some people are blessed genetically to do certain things. Um, there's a famous world champion swimmer. His body is just designed almost like, you know, think he was a fish, you know. He, he just can do it. Others develop their skills. Um, one expert I know said that if you want to be skilled in a certain thing, you need to spend 10,000 hours learning that skill. Either if it's a physical skill or it's a, a knowledge you need, if you spend 10,000 hours on it, you'll be an expert. Getting an education, a good education is one excellent way to develop one's skills. A good education not only allows, to earn, or allows one to earn a better salary, but also makes it possible for one to make a greater contribution to the church and society in general. Remember back in, at, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God told Moses that there were two men that had exceptional skills, Bezalel and Aholiab. Now, let me ask you a question. This is just speculation, hypothetical. Do you think these guys were very skilled before God blessed them? Of course. Probably. They probably were already well skilled, and then God blessed them so they were even better skilled. And what did they do? They taught other people how to do various aspects of those skills. And they built that fabulous sanctuary there at the foot of Mount Sinai. To be successful in anything, you must practice it again and again until you can do it well. Uh, Kerry? Yes, as the lessons of the Bible are wrought into the daily life, they have a deep and lasting influence upon the character. These lessons Timothy learned and practiced. He had no specially brilliant talents, but his work was valuable because he used his God-given abilities in the Master's service. This came from the Youth Instructor, February 13, 1902. Okay, so... You know, we look at Timothy and I think, wow, here's someone who spent a lot of time with Paul. He must have been a genius. Apparently not. But he, he, he focused on what was really important. So, Fred, you have another passage there for us? Yes, in Romans uh, 13, verses 7 and 8, and this is from the Good News Bible. Pay then what you owe them. Pay them your personal and property taxes and show respect and honor for them all. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. That's a pretty comprehensive statement, isn't it? Whoever has done this has obeyed the law. You know, there's a statement that you probably all have heard at one time or another. There's only two things you have to do in life, pay taxes and die, right? So tax, tax season is coming up. We know how that works. So how would we respond today to those who say, we shouldn't worry about going into debt because Jesus is coming back soon. What's the idea there? Shirking our responsibilities. Yes. The idea is maybe we, if we're lucky, we won't have to pay back, right? So how long has Jesus waited so far? Well, since 1844, it's been 173 years. And we have no way of knowing how much longer he's going to wait. We certainly, it certainly looks like we're coming down to the end. But you better not bet on it. Um, so if a person owes $10,000 and the Lord comes, is that person still in trouble? What do you think? That's a good question. Are you in trouble because you 
owe money. It depends on what you owe it for. If you're, it's a gambling debt, you probably are in trouble. <laughs> but if it's for doing something good, I mean, building a house or buying a car that you need or something, I don't think that would be considered to be trouble. What did you have in mind? I was just asking the question. Because mm -hmm. you're worried about somebody just borrowing a whole bunch of money and then saying the Lord's going to come and so you won't have to pay it back. I can tell you a very interesting story and I can't give you the exact dates and details. But um, uh, God sometimes does things that saves money in very interesting ways. At, at the beginning of the Great Depression, there were many banks that got shut down. And before that happened, the, the, one of the treasures of the General Conference who was responsible for sending money to our work in Europe um, was working late. I think it was on a Friday. Pretty sure it was on a Friday. And he said, you know, it's not really time for me to, to send our money over to the people in Europe right now, but, but I just have an impression that I need to do that. So he went down to the bank, drew out a huge bunk, bunch of money, transferred it across the Atlantic Ocean to the people in Europe for the work there. And Monday morning, the Depression hit and all the banks were closed. Mm -hmm. So that happened on Friday night? Well, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. That was actually... Friday, I... Well, it had to be Friday afternoon because the bank was still open. Okay, yeah. You're probably right there. Yeah. No, it so... Actually, it actually happened. It's yeah. documented. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's documented. <coughs> but when you said he'd worked late, I didn't think that... Well, you, you know, you Friday afternoon, the Adventists... They usually don't work. <laughs> yeah, Friday, Friday yeah, afternoon. After 2 o'clock, yeah. it's late. Yeah. <laughs> Friday. <laughs> yeah, so... Except where I work in Loma Linda. Yeah. <laughs> well, are there certain safeguards we should put in place to avoid going into debt? If we manage to save even a small amount of money each month and invest it wisely, does that protect us from debt? Credit cards are marvelous and useful tools. I mean, today you you almost never need cash. You can just about anything with a credit card. You but know, they, when you say that um, invest your money, what do you mean by that? Wisely. Well, how do you invest it? And what what do you have in mind when you invest? Well, it, mean, it means you're putting it in, putting out the money changers as as Jesus suggested, and you you get you get a certain percentage back. Okay, so. You're giving it to the bank who lends it out, so you're you're um, making other people go into debt, so that well, people all facilitating, <laughs> <back>. facilitating. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you, you well you hope you that make you your hope, money one way or the other. <laughs> you hope that people are starting new businesses with it and so forth, and it's a good investment. Okay. Mm or building houses. Or yeah. Credit cards, and I, 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 I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about them, but you know they can be, people can just get way in over their heads with credit cards. It's financial leprosy. Yeah. Could heavenly investments and wise earthly investments actually complement each other in some way? That should be true, shouldn't it? God has done a perfect job of providing sinners an escape from their sinful wickedness. He is perfectly capable of helping us to escape from financial indebtedness as well. Think of the problems that have occurred as a result of debt. It has resulted in divorces, even suicides and depression. We noted earlier that Satan and all of his evil forces would do anything possible to get us, to tie, get us tied up in worldly pursuits and debt to take our minds away from the real spiritual things we should be focusing on. One of the worst things that we can do is having a credit card and only make a minimum payment each month while the sum we owe continues to increase. That's a guaranteed way into debt bankruptcy. Debt, debt is now a worldwide epidemic. I see we have a, mis, we have a uh, misprint there. It's debt is a, now a worldwide epidemic. The United States, which at one time was a major creditor to the world, is now a debtor. So we come now to Proverbs 22.7. That's fine. Okay. Uh, poor people are slaves of the rich. Borrow money and you are the lender's slave. Okay. There's Bible. We should not re need to remind people, especially in the developed world, that the interest paid on credit cards is highly unfavorable. 
Sometimes they charge as much as 20% annual interest. That's insane. Some of them as high as 36 or something. Yeah. Could we in our day be surrendering to instant gratification, sell our spirit, by surrendering to instant gratification, sell our spiritual birthright like Esau did? We live in this world, we've talked about this already, of instant meals, microwave ovens, overnight loans, easy credit, fast food restaurants. There's instant communication around the world. When my family and I first went to Africa to serve as, as missionaries over there, it took a month from the time you wrote a letter, sent it, mailed it to the United States for it to get there, people to respond. Even though we responded the same day and sent a letter back, it took a month one way. By the time we left Africa, 17 years later, you could pick up your phone and dial anywhere in the world just about. Think about what a change has happened. And, of course, what that leads to people to think is, I want it now and I will find a way to get it now. You, you know? send documents anywhere in the yeah. world in, in seconds. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. Well, is that good, though? We can send documents anytime in seconds? Well, Anywhere it's communication. It, 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 no, you know, yeah, I would like to tell people right now versus wait for two months. That's yeah. <laughs> all. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not that long back. If you wanted to call halfway around the world, it was underwater cables. Yeah. And sometimes that was clear, and sometimes it was anything but clear. Exactly. They break all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, how can we differentiate between real needs and wants? I think, Jim, you were asking that earlier. What about differentiating between things that can wait and things that need immediate attention? And then there's the famous verse, not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Do we allow the love of money to lead us into all kinds of problems? We live in a world where entitlements and greed are causing the nations of the world to go deeper and deeper into debt. People believe that they have a right to things, even if they can't pay for them. I have a right to this. So we have one final comment. Gary, you want to read that last one for us? I think it's oh, running out of time. I'm sorry. So it's not wrong to, to, to want nice things. It's wrong to covet them. Loving money can be a problem. Um, and I, we don't have time to talk about that, but you're free to get our guides. You can look at it. I think we all know about the challenges of loving money too much. God bless you. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to serve you, to be constantly under your guidance and care and direction. May we uh, do what is your will, not incurring debt that's going to turn our attention away from you, but to invest in heaven is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.